Welcome to the Friday, September 30th, 2011 edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dyke sitting in for Alex while he's out on assignment. Now, coming up in the show tonight, we have two in-studio guests from the Florida Action Network. That would be Dr. Griffin Cole and Laura Presley, Ph.D. We also have a two-part fluoride special report coming up. Uh, but first, the news. Two U.S.-born terrorists were killed in the CIA-led drone strike. That would be top al-Qaeda leader Anwar al the double agent who dined at the Pentagon admittedly and was now assassinated, the first U.S. citizen to be targeted by predator drones killed in Yemen, according to official reports. However, he has been reported dead more than five times before. We have the report from Steve Watson, no more Pentagon dinners, Al-Qaeda leader killed again, and it gets into how there were many untimely reports of his death. So with more on that, we take you now to a special report on the life and times of CIA Pentagon asset Anwar al a U.S. counterterrorism official says American forces targeted al-Qaeda cleric Anwar al-Awlaki's convoy in Yemen with a drone and jet attack and believe he's been killed. The Yemeni government says the airstrike happened near the eastern town of Kashef. Al-Awlaki is on a U.S. kill or capture list. The cleric, known for his fiery anti-American rhetoric, has been suspected of ties to the Fort Hood attack and the attempted Christmas Day airliner bombing in 2009. The Pakistani-American who pleaded guilty to the May 2010 Times Square car bombing attempt told interrogators he was inspired by al-Awlaki after making contact over the Internet. In July, U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said the Yemeni-American was a priority target. The Yemen Defense Ministry, when they first came out with with report guys uh, about an hour and ten minutes ago, said it was their doing, that they were involved, that, that they were the ones that, that got him. First of all, what is the hard, confirm identification of it? Where is the body? And, and what are we doing with that body? And so far, uh, it is Friday Prayers Day, so uh, Yemeni government officials are kind of out of contact in this time period. But we should... FBI documents obtained as part of an ongoing Fox investigation state that Anwar al now the first American on the CIA's killer capture list, was a lunch guest of the military. After being vetted by a Defense Department employee, quote, al was invited to and attended a luncheon at the Pentagon in the Secretary of the Army's Office of Government Counsel. al who was the imam at this mosque in Falls Church, Virginia, was interviewed at least four times by the FBI in the first week after 9-11 because of his previous contact with three of the hijackers who struck the Pentagon. This information was apparently never reviewed by the Pentagon. An Army spokesman insisted that the lunch was not an Army event, but rather it was sponsored by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He's a controlled asset, and of course it's not a matter of failure to connect the dots. We're hearing all about the unconnected dots. No, this is the desired outcome. Let me just point out a couple of other things here. Uh, we're told that uh, the, uh, the, this uh, alleged uh, bomber, right, the Nicker bomber, whatever they call him, uh, he was in contact with this character Awlaki in Yemen, and of course, he, this Awlaki, I call him Awlaki the CIA lackey. Awlaki the lackey, and remember, he's a CIA lackey. He's a double agent, a triple agent, if you want. He is used uh, as a kind of beacon to recruit patsies across the world, and they can always sheep dip somebody like Major Hassan if they want to say, you're linked to Al-Qaeda, they just have you exchange a few emails with this Awlaki, and that's what he's good for, right? He goes back to 9-11 and Hani Hanjour. So this, this guy, is uh, he's, he's, a, he's a U.S. agent under whatever layers of, of garb that he's got. The other thing is, how was this uh, young uh, patsy, uh, Omar Farouk Mutalab, how was he radicalized? And I think we're getting some pretty good indications that it's this Brixton Mosque, Finsbury Mosque, Access in London, the school for patsies, the, the British patsies. Which, patsies. by the way, six months ago, I remember it, you predicted we'd see plane bombings out of that mosque. It, this is not so hard to do. Remember Richard Reed, Richard Reed, mentally retarded vagrant who was sleeping on the floor of Brixton Mosque, I think. He was given the same PETN uh, explosive by somebody, so that's what this, this uh, Omar Farouk was given then, allegedly, once again, in in Yemen. So you can see it, it all it fits together and it, it all comes from these same these 
same places. There are reports today that the Christmas Day body bomber met with an American-born radical cleric, Anwar al-Awlaki. He's believed to be living in Yemen, al-Awlaki is. He's not only been linked to al-Qaeda in the past, but he reportedly exchanged emails with the suspected Fort Hood shooter, Nadal Hassan, before that shooting massacre in Texas. Now again, Anwar al-Awlaki, the CIA lackey, as Webster Tarpley appropriately calls him, is connected to all these foiled terror plots. He is connected to, as the clip mentions, three, at least three, of the 9-11 hijackers. He was interviewed by the FBI more than four times, and yet he was invited to the Pentagon only months after 9-11 to meet with top brass. That really should tell a huge story about what's going on in this phony war on terror. Now, on the other side of the same coin, you have today in the news, or this week in the news, rather, Rezwan Ferdas, the man accused of trying to blow up the Capitol and Pentagon using a remote-controlled airplane, and he was once again admittedly set up by the FBI. They provocateured him, lured him into extremist action, uh, gave him what appeared to be the bomb and the other weapons, including phony AK-47s and so forth, and this is the pattern we have seen repeatedly, especially since 9-11, but also long before it, where the FBI is directly behind setting up uh, random patsies they find on the streets, these mentally uh, low iq people and so-called extremists to use them to advance the public agenda so the public believes these plots are always happening. Meanwhile, the FBI is admittedly behind them. Even Geraldo was on Fox News talking about how bogus this whole paradigm is. And remember, too, the FBI was admittedly behind the 1993 World Trade Center bombing cooking the bomb, giving it to those people, and encouraging them to carry out their attempted act of terrorism, which killed four people. Let's go to this clip now. They say that just today, the operatives, the undercover operatives, gave Ferdas material that was supposed to be the explosive material C4. They say only a small amount of it was the real thing. A law enforcement official also tells us they gave him AK-47s and grenades, but those were not functional. We have to stress one very important point, Wolf. A U.S. law enforcement official CNN spoke with today said there was no danger to the public since undercover operatives were involved very early on. There's at least 20 plots I've read about where the FBI admittedly used entrapment techniques. These people may have hated the country. They may have even been radical in their minds, but they had no means to carry out the things they were accused of. They only became dangerous once they were set up through these FBI systems. And it's all just a fraud meant to trick the public. And we've had enough of it. We need to learn what's going on and say no to this entire phony war on terrorism because they are clamping down on our freedoms as ordinary. Americans. Now, as we're talking about the police state domestic terrorism clampdown in this country, there's an entirely different kind of clampdown that continues to go on. You've heard about lemonade stands being shut down. You've heard about Gibson guitars not able to manufacture in the U.S. You've heard about lemon trees being seized and quarantined. Now in Wisconsin, a very controversial and important ruling where a judge has said, you do not have a right to produce your own food or even eat the foods of your own choice. He's, he specifically ruled that plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to own and use a dairy cow. They do not have a fundamental right to consume the milk from their own cow, do not have a fundamental right to board their cow at a farm or with a certain farmer, and that private contracts don't fall outside the scope of the state's police power. And furthermore, that there's no fundamental right to even produce or consume foods of their own choice. That is absolutely radical, and they've used the FDA and the other arms of the federal government, just agencies with policies, to try to tell Americans that the government will tell them what to eat, when and where, but that making your old choices, using raw dairy, you've seen the raids on Rawson Foods and others. It's just incredible, but it continues to happen. The raids on the Amish dairy farmers and all the rest of it. Here's a video we put together highlighting some of the past clamp down on what should really be ordinary American behavior that even the founding fathers warned tyrannical government would control. Remember Julie Bass? She's the Oak Park mom who's being prosecuted for putting a vegetable garden in her front yard. Why? Because the city's ordinance says a front yard has to have suitable live plant material. Get off my property. I don't want you here. 
I'm shutting my garage. Get out of my garage. Listen, now we get the right to interrogate you and find not interrogate you, but we didn't I got the right to remain silent. Okay, listen. I, I invoke the right to, right to remain silent, so. I waved at you. Just, hey, how's it going? And you call me a Nazi? Mm hmm. Why are you calling me a Nazi? Because you're acting like one. You need to get off my property. I need to see your ID. I'm standing in my garage. Yes, sir, you are. You are violating my Fourth Amendment. Show me a search warrant. I'll have search warrant. You're in my property. No, no, no. You're not I'll welcome here. You. You're not so welcome here. I need your here. driver's license. I need some form of ID. I'm handing him my ID. This is not constitutionally allowed. This guy's uh, violating my Fourth Amendment right. Both of y'all should be ashamed of yourselves. You're violating your oath to the Constitution right now. Okay. We are not slaves. You work for me, buddy. Turn around for me, sir. For what? Turn around for me. For what? Am I under arrest? I'm under arrest. Yes, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Don't let the, don't be intimidated by them. Whoa, whoa! Hey, hey, hey! Leave these people alone! I'm sorry, you're under arrest. Leave these people alone! Leave them alone! I am getting arrested for selling my. Do you guys have surgery? Ten cents, guys. We've got a few cups. Do I have help? You sell lemonade. Why are you kidding me? I'm selling lemonade. People. Is there anything wrong? No. You people should be ashamed. Citizens in the Southern California town of Venice are outraged following a police raid on a raw food store all over a few bottles of milk. These uh, foods that have now been made illegal, raw, raw goat milk, raw juice, raw anything. I mean, especially raw products. I mean, you can't go to the Whole Foods and the, the farmer's market anymore because they're controlled by the health department. And those places can't sell unpasteurized juices, unrefrigerated eggs. They can't sell the rough ceviche. They can't sell. I mean, the list is so ridiculous at this point. And this is tyranny. Again, we're seeing a clampdown on really what should be some of the most wholesome behavior in America. That's classic America, lemonade stands and the rest of it. Then the coup de grace on top of it, you see them repeatedly pushing away the cameras. Don't even show what they're doing. Don't document it. No First Amendment, no right to consume your own foods. The Founding Fathers warned about this, and it's disgusting. Then you've seen the news where they're going to start doing TSA-style pat-downs at all the NFL stadiums, but... One small step in the right direction, Lambeau Field, home of the Green Bay Packers, at least has decided for the time being to only use metal detectors rather than the full pat-downs and the touching of uh, private parts. The National Football League is pushing for enhanced security and starting with Sunday's game at Lambeau. All fans will be subjected to a handheld metal detecting wand before being admitted. That's from the Green Bay Press-Gazette. Now, I think all this security is overdone, but at least they've said no for the time being to the full-on TSA-style deal. We know Homeland Security has been working with the NFL. They did the past Super Bowl that took place in Dallas, and I guarantee you they're behind this overall agenda. And we just need to say no. They're not going to stop the mobs who get drunk and celebrate after victories or losses alike and tear up public property. This is just about training the public, of course, as Alex always says, to be the slaves that society is becoming. Now, on the other side of the news, we have vaccines and coming up in a few minutes, fluoride. But just last week, a couple days ago, Dr. Merkula wrote how vaccines have serious side effects and the Institute of Medicine says so. That is, they're now admitting that vaccines are not free from side effects or adverse effects. They're admitting that the admission came after a review of more than a thousand vaccine studies which found convincing evidence of 14 health outcomes, including seizures, inflammation of the brain, and fainting that could be caused by certain vaccines. The truth is nobody knows how many vaccine victims there are in America and how many of the one in six learning disabled children or one in nine with asthma or the one in 100 who develop autism or the one in 100 and 450 who become diabetic can trace it to the chronic inflammation, disease, and disability back to the vaccine reactions. And yet, we know it's going on. 
Now, of course, with public health coming up to speed in the 50s, we've seen most of the worst kinds of infectious diseases go way, way down. And yet these vaccines are being pushed by the establishment with the perception that it's mandatory when, of course, it isn't. Uh, we all have a right to our own freedom and health, despite what the Wisconsin judge would say. But these vaccines are admittedly causing more problems than the diseases they attempt to cut down on. Now, at the same time, we have a clip about the whooping cough out of New Zealand, where they've again made it seem like it's mandatory and people are getting hurt by it. Here's one of those clips right now. Brittany Collins is the hidden face of vaccinations. There you go, Brittany. Wheelchair bound, brain damaged. She's severely disabled. I mean, she's lovely. She was crippled by a vaccine. She can't stand or sit or um, hold anything. The 20-year-old is on accident compensation for an adverse reaction to the whooping cough vaccine. Yeah. Since Brittany's elder brother had an adverse reaction to the whooping cough vaccine, Cherie asked her specialist if she should vaccinate Brittany. And he said, yes, immunise her at normal. There's no chance of reaction. She'll be fine. And what occurred after that? She became very unhappy. Um, she basically was screaming night and day. It was quite a strange cry. That's enough, but you notice how this poor girl who was damaged, permanently disabled for the rest of her life, they told her to get the vaccine even after her own brother was damaged by it. And the same disgusting Tdap push uh, was happening in America. You saw in California, Natoma school officials go door to door to find unvaccinated students. And this ignorant, just hateful little boot licking system lover had the audacity to go to people's doors and tell them it's required to get vaccines when it's been on record for years that there's a waiver for religious or even just personal conscientious objection. And again, these vaccines are doing more harm than the diseases they try to stop. You also saw Mike Adams of Natural News reporting that the CDC is now calling homes in the U.S. and demanding that they provide their child's immunization records as part of a vaccine surveillance and tracking program. And it's just pure intimidation. There's no law. We have a right to our own bodies and to at least attempt to make responsible decisions, yet they persist in this. I believe we have another clip. Let's go to that right now. This is Jasmine Renata. She was just 18 when she died. Her family suspect a vaccine was to blame. Her parents believe the Gardasil vaccine aimed to combat cervical cancer took her life almost two years ago. After the first injection, she said she had the tinglings in her hands. She said her hands were had pins and needles in them. She's getting stomach pains, warts on her hands, and then the chest pains that she was having, and the racing heart, and it was just one thing after another. A year later, and six months after her third injection, Rhonda would have her last conversation with Jasmine. She put her hand out, and she goes, look, these warts are coming back again. The next day, they found their girl dead in bed. The Renatas have sent Jasmine's tissue samples to a Canadian neuroscientist for further testing. He says he happens to share my belief that aluminium and other toxic compounds in the vaccine may have been the key causal factors in Jasmine's health problems and death. It's still and of course, that is not the only clip. Both of these are from foreign media news services. But we have uh, CBS here in America with dozens of reports on the harm that Gardasil's done to girls. Now they're pushing it on boys as well. And of course, right now in the GOP primary, we have globalist Bilderberg attendee pimp Rick Perry, who gave the perception that it was mandated in Texas, which really got the ball rolling for the Gardasil in particular. Of course, he had Merck donations and the rest of it. And you heard Russell Blaylock last week on InfoWars Nightly News talking about how well under 2% of people even report the adverse reactions and yet more than 18,000 adverse reactions have been reported far more than the annual deaths from cervical cancer which Gardasil is expected to treat or supposedly would treat and there's been many deaths as well at least 30 reported but I know it's much more than that. It is so sad that they push this forward. We're going to go now to Dr. Nikki Turner from the Immunization Advisory Center, IMAC, and she's defending vaccines, admitting, well, there could be reactions, but we're going to force them on the whole public anyway. It's time to wake up to this and stop going along with this 
thing we've gotten used to where everyone's supposed to get these vaccines. That clip now, please. So paralysis from Guillain-Barre syndrome, four cases. Hmm. Serious? Guillain-Barre can be serious. It's a spectrum. It can be very mild to really serious. So if you have a Guillain-Barre case, you'll pay out on ACC because it may have been associated with the vaccine and we will never know. So why don't I, when I pick up my leaflet, it says, caution, this vaccine could paralyse your child. Yes, well it does in the data sheets, but your pamphlet would need to be more than two pages long because of all the possibilities of what any medication or vaccine could possibly be related to. In New Zealand we have no recorded deaths from vaccination. It's really important that we report everything that happens after vaccination. You'll see a lot of reports related to children who have died after vaccinations were given, but we are vaccinating pretty well every child in the population. You're going to see deaths happening. And my understanding from the data is none of them have been shown to be caused by the vaccine. It says medicine may be contributory. Yeah, well, that, that would be the standard way of saying it, because in science you would never say never appropriately. But if we do get a case, or a second case, or a third case... Yeah, no, no confirmed deaths, but of course deaths will happen, and isn't it annoying how long the adverse reaction sheet is and the warnings... Well, coming up, we have a full second half of the show of Florida Special. Again, we have the in-studio guests from the Florida Action Network. They're coming up and the special reports. But I want to remind you to please subscribe to InfoWars Nightly News. We depend on your support. We're not corporate supported. And we want to make this show better and better and get it out to as many people as possible and try to make it a condensed, palatable, but hard-hitting news program. So please help us with that. InfoWarsNews.com. We're going to break right now, and we'll be back with the fluoride special Ladies in a second. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back from break. Again, I'm Aaron Dykes sitting in. Alex is going to be back on Monday. But we want to take you now to a special fluoride report we've put together just for this episode of the InfoWars Nightly News and the several segments. You're going to see them coming up. Now, the first one is hidden footage never before seen from the Austin water treatment plant where they add the fluoride after the filtration process. I went on this tour and we also sat through a lecture along with some of the fluoride action people from here in the area. And it's incredible. They have a pretty reasonable water treatment facility, several stages of filtration, and then they just add the corrosive, deadly and harmful fluoride on top of it after cleaning the rest of the water. It's shameful, but we're going to take you now to that report so you can see for yourself what really goes on to your water. For more than 60 years, the federal government in the United States, as well as many other governments across the planet, have carried out an elaborate hoax designed to convince the public that fluoride is added to most water supplies to improve oral hygiene. This report will examine the facts. Hundreds of chemicals are added to municipal water supplies, all under the name fluoride. Sodium fluoride and its variants are the chemical byproducts of aluminum fertilizer, cement, steel, and nuclear weapons manufacturing. Children who ingest fluoride will actually get a form of tooth decay called dental fluorosis, dark brown stains, and tooth decay. The American Dental Association recently put out a nationwide alert. In the memo, they warned parents not to make baby formula using fluoridated water. Fluoride is the active ingredient in many pesticides, like rat poison. Fluoride has been proven to cause brain damage, reduced IQ, impairs memory and learning. It has been conclusively shown to cause damage in the kidneys. It has been directly linked to bone disease, bone cancer, reduced thyroid activity. And it has also been proven that it's linked to other cancers. Unfortunately, this is only the beginning of the list of medical issues directly related to the ingestion of fluoride. After years of attempting to get the city of Austin to allow our crew in to show the deadly poison-filled fluoride tanks, we were finally allowed to. But the tour guide at the water treatment plant told us that it was their policy that we not shoot video. Well, it's our policy to show the people of Central Texas and the world who are being forcibly fluoridated to see the truth. It is our policy to resist tyranny. So here's the footage. Okay, that's what it is, though. The storage so, tanks are in that building. So there's tank two and tank one. Oh, and then this is a discharge line, uh, like a return line for him to... Well, you know, we have things in... 
tour guide even jokingly pointed out the fact that the fluoride acid would eat holes in the concrete and paint. See, see this corrosion here? Mm -hmm. This is not corroding just from the air. This is from acid vapors in here, okay? So they've had to go in and, and it looks like replace this, okay? They had to take it out, it looks like. Here you can see the pipes where they lovingly pump the carcinogenic, brain-eating chemical weapon into you and your children's water supply. This type of fluoride-based acid has the CDC's highest danger rating of number four. Again, it is in the most dangerous class of chemicals with an MSDS health rating of four. Life-threatening, major or permanent damage may result from a single or repeated exposure. Organ failure, cancer, the list goes on and on, all purposely pumped into your water supply. If sodium fluoride and its other variants are so dangerous, then why are more than 70% of U.S. cities forcing it on their citizens as a form of forced medication? Eugenics is the long-standing plan of population control and domination being quietly carried out by those who are determined to bring about a one-world government and a new world order. Fluoride was used by the Nazis to poison the water in the concentration camps and slave labor camps. The Nazis knew that the brain-damaging effects of fluoride would enable them to control the populations with more ease. Today, fluoride is being forced upon Americans in more than 70% of the country. This is not law, it is a federal mandate. Because the population is becoming aware and medical doctors are speaking out, the feds are now lobbying states like Arkansas to pass laws commanding local governments to add high levels of sodium fluoride to their water supplies. As Americans are becoming more educated about the issue, many activists are standing up to water fluoridation and laying the groundwork for taking it out of their water supply. Dr. Paul Conant is the executive director of the Fluoride Action Network. Thanks to Dr. Conant's efforts, the Calgary City Council voted 10 to 3 to remove toxic substances from their public drinking water. A few days ago, it was finalized that Calgary in Alberta, that's 1.1 million people, are now going to be fluoride free. Now, many other cities in the U.S. and across the world are following suit. And that's why the establishment is striking back. Tim Cameron of Mount Clemens City, Michigan, proposed to his city council to have all fluoride removed from the tap water and won with a 6-0 to zero vote. Agenda item 9C, request commission approval of a resolution rescinding the addition of fluoride at the City of Mount Clemens Water Filtration Plant. I need a motion, please. Mo motion to approve a resolution rescinding the addition of fluoride at the City of Mount Clemens Water Filtration Plant. Second. We'll call, please. Campbell? Yes. Draker? Yes. Gager? Yes. Hill? Yes. Johns? Yes. Flash? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. That's what one man did by simply presenting the scientific facts to his counsel. State Representative Dr. Joe Hensley of Tennessee sent letters to every district in his state urging them to stop adding fluoride to the drinking water and has had very successful results. In future reports, we will document the fact that under the name fluoride, upwards of 300 plus chemicals are legally added to your water supply. Americans are forced to drink a literal toxic waste stew that is left over from different industries who would have to pay to store the toxic waste. Instead, our cities, in some cases, pay millions of dollars a year for the poison. The good news is people all over the world, not just the United States, are waking up. Right here in Austin, we're seeing more and more restaurants advertising that they have fluoride-free, healthy, clean, filtered water. Our reporter, Darren McBreen, traveled to one of these restaurants to talk to the owner. Darren McBreen. Thanks, Alex. We're standing outside of Hopdotties, a local hamburger restaurant located in South Austin. Now, this is just one of the many restaurants in town choosing organic and locally produced ingredients over GMO and conventionally farmed foods. However, Hop Dotties has taken this trend one step further. They're also removing the fluoride as well as other toxins from the drinking water that they serve their customers. You'd be surprised that it's a small percentage that really appreciate it, um, but the ones that, that do understand what fluoride does to you, they are ecstatic. They, they love seeing that.
Sodium fluoride is a chemical byproduct of aluminum, phosphate, cement, steel, and nuclear weapons manufacturing. It reduces IQ, impairs memory and learning, it has shown to poison kidney function, it causes bone disease as well as reduced thyroid activity, and is a proven cause of cancer. Well, not only is it bad for humans, it's also bad for uh, animals of all kinds as well. I just don't understand why fluoride needs to be in the water to begin with. I do not think it belongs no. in our water supply. said it's for promoting like tooth health, oral hygiene, and stuff like that. It's supposed to be good for your teeth. Anything in the water supply doesn't sound like something that I'd be for. So if I, if I know something's being put into a water supply that doesn't necessarily have to be there, I'd rather it not be there. Back in elementary school, they made you like gargle that stuff and like and like wash your mouth out with it. But I just remember it made me sick every time I had it. So it's like I don't know if it needs to be in my water. I think it's just awful. I don't think anything should be added to the water supply that doesn't need to be added. And it just it just sounds scary. Anything that's being put into a city's water supply without without everybody's consent. So would you like to see all the restaurants turn the corner like you are and remove the fluoride from the drinking water that they serve their customers? Well, I like to, I like to see the city turn the corner and remove all the fluoride and, and, not, and not burden everyone with putting RO systems in their, in their restaurants. I think that would be the best way to do it. But I, I think that we can get the word out by doing that. And I would, lo would love to see more restaurants do that. Well, you know, a lot of advocates are, are starting to educate people, and more and more people are becoming aware of the dangers of sodium fluoride. In fact, right down the street, Hop Dotties, yeah. have, they've made a conscious decision to remove the sodium fluoride from the drinking water that they serve their customers. Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's great. I actually uh, go over there quite a bit. I appreciate it, yeah. I don't want, if they can filter out anything, the more filtration of the water, the better. I think it's great that they're they're standing by something. They, they believe in it. I'd like it if a lot more businesses started to do that. They actually spent the money to to take it out of their own water supply. I think that's pretty cool. They don't need to spend money to take it out. It just needs to not be there to begin with. I'd like it personally if Austin stopped putting the fluoride in the water altogether. The majority of people we talk to on the street flat out don't approve of sodium fluoride being added to their water, which is why we applaud individual activists and activist groups like the Fluoride Action Network who stand in the way of fluoridating public water supplies. And thanks to restaurants like Hop Dotties playing a role in the health of their customers and their community. I'm Darren McBreen for InfoWars Nightly News. So as you can see, although not everyone's informed about fluoride, those who are don't want it added to the water. And as we've otherwise demonstrated, it's not good science. It's not good health. And it's important we recognize that because the bioethicists of the world and the elites are trying to add more chemicals to our drinking water, such as the proposals for lithium just to treat a few people with depression. Then there's the prescription medicine that's in the water anyway. Now, we want to show you a clip from May 2011. We showed you some other clips from Dr. Paul Conant, pretty much the leading anti-fluoride activist out there yesterday and here in this clip at a round table with Alex they talk about some of the successes and how really the tide is beginning to turn especially as the public becomes more aware but at the same time these mid-level bureaucrats have no interest in helping out the public they supposedly serve. Dr. Connor, thanks for coming in. Well thank you Alex. You know water fluoridation is not the most important issue confronting our planet but it's the easiest one to end. All you need is a strong wrist to turn off the tap. Once the tap is turned off, it's over. But you need the political will to turn the tap off. And to get that political will, we need people informed and we need people organized. Thanks to you, millions of people around the world are being informed on this issue. And thanks to uh, Fluoride Free Texas, thousands of people in the city of Austin are being formed about the issue and organized, being organized on the issue. So we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that Austin, Texas will be our next big victory. A few days ago, it was finalized that Calgary in Alberta, that's 1.1 million people, are now going to be fluoride free and uh, after 20 years. And people in Waterloo, Ontario, voted it out. So the squeeze is on Ontario. And don't forget that most of British Columbia and most of Quebec, the wings of Canada, are already fluoridation-free. And we're squeezing on Alberta with Calgary out, Edmonton maybe next, and then 
we're squeezing on Ontario. If Ontario was to go, if Toronto was to go, or even Ottawa was to go, I think it would be the end of fluoridation in Canada. Meanwhile, we've got a very good organizing group in New Zealand. FAN New Zealand is excellent, and FAN Australia has just been, been formed. So there's a fight back everywhere. And then a few days ago, I was in Dublin, which is mandatory fluoridation because of American pressure back in the 1960s. Ireland has mandatory fluoridation. It's the odd man out in Europe. Only three countries in Europe have any fluoridation at all. England at 10%, Spain at 3%, and Ireland at 73%. But lots of people in Ireland don't want this fluoride in their water. But many other people don't know it's there. Now, you've been talking about some of the big cities that are yeah. going fluoride-free. I've, I've seen reports like towns outside Austin, like Lago Vista, right. uh, uh, having it removed. Other cities not putting it in. Big fights in places like San Diego, uh, where they've had to uh, you know, bring in supposed yeah. private money to do it. Um, I've tried to work out for 15 years. You notice in our book, it's the last chapter, trying to understand motivations. Now, for the, the, the rank-and-file dentists and doctors, it's very simple. They're too busy treating patients to read the literature. Most of them don't. You've got a wonderful guy in, in Austin, Griffin Cole. He's a dentist. He has done the, read the literature, and he's very much opposed to it. A uh, very important man, Griffin Cole. But most dentists and doctors don't have time to read the literature. We do, of course, three professors here, retired professors at, at that. Then you've got the people in the middle of the bureaucracy. Basically, they are trained not to question policy. Policy is determined in Washington or in the... It's like the military. They follow so orders. They, they follow orders, literally. And the CDC, remember, is in uniform. It's a uniform branch of the, of the, the, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, CDC. They're in uniform. Surgeon General. Surgeon General. It, as you say, it's a l chain of command. So don't expect the middle bureaucrats, don't expect the health officers in the cities. To and then the big chemical companies, they lobby the politicians that give the orders to the bureaucrats, who give the orders to the unquestioning minions, that then put it in our water, and meanwhile it's a pesticide. I mean, they had a guy in California a few months ago who went to a house that was being gassed to kill bed bugs. Yeah. He walked in, a homeless guy, for like a minute, and it and killed him. Killed him. Sure, and yeah. it killed him, and it said... Oh, and That's it, the same stuff. That's sulfuryl fluoride. Yeah. Been used, Vicane, been used for years to fumigate buildings. So this is simple. He walked in, and seconds was dead. That's right. And, and, and this is what they're pumping the food with. And, and you were talking about the numbers of what gets in white flour and things. Yeah, the, the level in the flour that was being permitted by the EPA was 125 parts per million, and that flour wheat flour goes into dough, pizza dough, bread, cookies, cakes, and so on. And there's no doubt that's to kill bugs. <laughs> so, so, so you're eating something that's meant to kill bugs. Now, yeah. I'm no rocket scientist, yeah. but, uh, I mean, that's insane. But, but the, 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 the top of the chain of command, I, I went to the bottom, in the middle, what about the top? What's the motivation of these people in the Center of Disease Control, etc., Department of Health, Kathleen Sebelius? Why do they keep this going? For me, it's the fear of losing credibility. They have waxed lyrical so much for so long about this practice. I think they fear that if they lose fluoridation, they lose credibility. If they lose credibility, they lose other, the public's trust, which threatens other public health well, policies. Well, this is the same government that secretly injected black people with syphilis. Yeah. And now it's come out they were doing it in Latin America and the atomic soldiers. I mean, these people have no credibility. And, and I agree with you, doctor, at that level, at, at you know, the top policy wonks, but yeah. they're taking orders from people like John P. Holdren and uh, people he admired uh, uh, before him who all wrote about putting things like this in the water to reduce fertility. Mm -hmm. And we know it reduces fertility. Mm -hmm. And we know that they see us as animals, as a uh, scourge upon the earth, and that's what my film, Endgame Blueprint for Global Enslavement, covers, is their own statements. This is being done by design. I know you only stick with what, yeah. you know, the actual chemicals. And I would, I would make a distinction between the, 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 the dentists and, and doctors out there who are usually very decent people. They're compartmentalized. Yeah, yeah. They do not. I don't think they have any any notion other than florida what they've been told that fluoridation is good for teeth uh, and that it's perfectly safe we have them on the ropes with the science you know the best the best study they've ever done on tooth decay in the united states they looked at 39,000 children in 84 communities and what did they conclude that if a child had lived all its life in a fluoridated community compared with a child that lived all its life in a non-fluoridated community there was a saving 
average saving for five to 17 year olds of 0 0.6, 0 0.6 of one tooth surface out of over 100 tooth surfaces in a child's mouth. And you have to say to yourself, is this world crazy? Are, are we doing all this to save 0.6 of a tooth surface? Are we going to threaten their brains, lower IQ, bone damage in adults, arthritis, lower thyroid function, all these possibilities mm. to save 0.6 of one tooth surface? It doesn't make sense, does it? So again, as you just saw in that Dr. Paul Connick clip, there are a lot of victories. The tide is beginning to turn. And of course, one of the cities he's been working with the most is right here in Austin. And we're joined now by two members of the Fluoride Free Austin, uh, Laura Presley, she's a PhD in physical chemistry, and Dr. Griffin Cole, he's a dentist here in town. And they're gonna tell us about some of the action that's been taking place right here in Austin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Aaron, thanks. Um, there's been a major change that's happened very recently. The supplier of the hydrofluorosilicic acid that Austin uses as their fluoride source and their fluoride chemical in the tap water, the supplier of the chemical changed their material safety data sheet as recently as May, the end of May. And um, I have looked at a lot of material safety data sheets in my career as a chemist, probably scores and scores of them. And I can say, honestly, I have never seen this type of health warning in a material safety data sheet. Um, do you want to read, do you like to read through that or? Yeah, let's go over that. And that's important, of course, because this is the company that admittedly uses aluminum byproducts and industrial waste, really, that they put in so much of the water throughout the country. Now we have a quote from that material data sheet here. It says, prolonged or repeated overexposure to fluoride compounds may cause fluorosis Fluorosis is characterized by skeletal changes consisting of osteosclerosis, hardening or abnormal density of the bone, as well as osteomalacia, softening of the bones, and by model discoloration of the enamel of teeth if exposure occurs during enamel formation. Symptoms may include bone and joint pain and limited range of motion. And of course, fluoride is known to be con a contributor to bone cancer, th thyroid disorder, brain inflammation, and even reduce sterility and fertility, kind of a common meme when we talk about these modern day chemicals and some of the agendas behind it. But again, the material data sheet's important because it's as good as an official admission right from the company that supplies the fluoride. Uh, and so tell us more about what this means. So what's interesting about uh, what you just read, and I'm gonna repeat just one phrase, um, if exposure occurs during enamel formation, what that signifies, and when, when Fluoride Free Austin, when we first saw this, we were incredibly alarmed and actually uh, glad that they admitted this. Most material safety data sheets are intended for this, uh, let me, the, workers. the workers, the chemical workers at the plant, the chemical handlers who are handling these chemicals and putting them into the water supply. This warning specifically targets infants whose teeth are erupting Right. and uh, young children who are having their secondary teeth come in. This is what's unusual about this. It, it's, it is warning and alarming the user, which is the city of Austin and other cities in the United States that use this supplier, that children can be affected. This is unusual and it is phenomenal because now we've taken this to our Austin City Council and said, you have been warned. You now have the duty to put this warning that you now have received from your, your supplier, this warning needs to go on to mm. our water bills, the end users of citizens of Austin. And this can right. be used across the country to go, anybody can take this um, to their city council and say, look, this has recently changed. You are now basically liable. You need to warn downstream of your citizens. That's the impact of this. Yeah, and of course, there was the CDC warning earlier in January of this year, warning that yes. uh, young people could also be affected, recommending to lower it from 1.2 parts per million standard to a 0.7. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we were talking about this earlier, there's so many uh, commercial forms of bottled water targeted directly at babies. Uh, can you tell us the impact of that, Dr. Cole? Well, this actually... This really dovetails nicely with what you just mentioned. And it was actually Health and Human Services and the EPA who did the, uh, who did the downgrading. So 
when you go down from 1.2 parts per million to 0.7, I think that was just a way to, 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 to let people know, wow, they're getting way too much exposure. Yep. I still don't think it's enough, but, but at least it's a start that they're acknowledging that this fluorosis, which for years was called a, uh, just a cosmetic effect, we now realize that's not true. This is a serious right. adverse effect. This is, a, this, is the, this is the physical thing that we see as human beings, but yes. we can't see inside that the thyroid's being lowered, that the pineal gland's being affected, and all these other things you mentioned. So it's interesting that, that this came out, it's very timely. Uh, but the baby water, there, the, there's now several suits. In fact, there's one very recently against Nestle and Gerber uh, because they were targeting on the bottles that was saying, you know, good for, for healthy teeth and good for babies to drink and that, and that's not true. And in fact, even uh, all, uh, besides the CDC, organized dentistry actually now warns that you really shouldn't be feeding or making right. formula with tap water. Mm -hmm. So even the people that have been standing behind it for so long are now realizing, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. Yeah, so is this going to put cities like Austin at a point of liability now that they're warning that it is dangerous? So if they continue to put in the fluoride, uh, what will that mean? I, I think that that is a, a pro high probability. Now that they've warned the city, the city has the duty, they have the information, and they have to pass that on. Yeah, so Fluoride Free Austin has spoken with councils. I know they've had several <laughs> presentations. Uh, can you tell us about some of the things they've said, and, and do you think the tide's going to turn here in Austin? Because cities across the nation, have you, as you know, have began you know, doing away with it or, or refusing to put it in. I really feel like it's happening. I mean, I think so, too. We, our group, uh, if, if you go to any city council meeting on any random week and they let citizens speak about whatever, there's always people that are talking about Every week someone speaks Every against week. fluoride. They're hearing it over and yes. over again. We've yes. met with council members privately, all of us, a group of... A lot of professionals, chemists, MDs, chiropractors, you name it. And we have sat there and provided them all the science and, and all the reasons why. You know, Austin should be the first large city in the, in the continental United States to get rid of it. It would start a huge trend, I believe. Yeah, a lot of credible people, but only a year or two years ago, they were laughing in people's faces uh, when they would bring this up at city council. Uh, now, again, here in Texas, just a little ways down the road, the big Longhorn rival, uh, College Station, just got rid of it. So uh, I guess the Aggie jokes aren't true. They're not as stupid as, uh, well, as we are bright. here in Austin. They, they, did a, they did an excellent job. They're, there's... I, I, my hat's off to their city council. They, it was just last week, they voted six to one to remove the fluoride from the budget. And they initially approached this as a budgetary issue because you know, times are hard and taxes are low and et cetera, where the tax incomes are not as high as they want them to be. Um, so then it got put back on the agenda to reevaluate. So they did that last week. And out of the seven council members, including the mayor, four out of the seven themselves went and did the research and looked at the most research, most recent research that's out there in the last 10 years and the issues of, of hypothyroidism, the issues of IQ in children, the issues of fluorosis and um, attention deficit disorder, which has been linked to fluoridation. Only in 2010, there was a, a publication, um, the journal Toxicity linked to those things. And they actually went out and did the research, came back and said, I don't want to fluoride in our water. It was phenomenal, yeah. and uh, only one of the members basically said, no, we want to keep fluoride in our water, and I trust all the, the dentists that just showed up um, without any kind of research on her own. And uh, so yeah. it was amazing what they did. It was very responsible and very respectful. So we want to show a graphic right now. There's the cumulative number of U.S. cities who have rejected or eliminated fluoridation by year, and I guess this chart goes back to 1990, yes. all the way up here right. to 2011, and it went from almost zero, just a couple cities, to now approaching 250 cities, and it's still growing. Still growing. I know uh, several Nashville suburbs recently uh, voted to do away with the fluoride. Now, of course, the people in Austin, that now that they've done the research, they need to serve the public as they were elected to do and actually get rid of it. Uh, what kind of action are we looking for on that? Well, we've met with them several times, as, a, uh, as I mentioned, and quite honestly, the easiest way would be to get four council members to just put on the agenda and just vote it. That's, that's what we're really hoping for. To go to a vote uh, with all the people would be a challenge because big money would come in. You're talking about the other options, collecting other signatures. Other options, and yeah, referendum. Yeah, signatures. That's not what we want to do. That's not what we want to do. We do it's not. It's going to be dragged out. It's going to yes. take too long. It's, and, and all we're asking for right now is a warning on the water bill, uh, clearly written, hopefully mm -hmm. in bold, saying do not give this to 
infants, young children, because that will at least raise eyebrows. And the parents say, well, if they can't have it, why should I be drinking it? That's our first, first agenda. Second agenda is get it out. And of course, you mentioned the cost too. Uh, I'm not sure if the numbers are up to date. I've heard it's more than a million dollars a year we pay to add a, a toxin to our water, which again, I took the tour of the water facilities. We just showed the footage earlier in this episode. And there's what looks to be a reasonable filtration system, several systems. And then once they have the clean water, which is already a great source from here in Central Texas, then they had the fluoride and, and the chlorine too, I believe, but that's another topic. It's it's about eight hundred thousand dollars a year, I think, is what the most recent number is to purchase it and get it in the water supply. Yeah, so if only for budgetary it. reasons, if, if uh, only we should for that. cut that back. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally agree. Uh, now I believe we have another graphic uh, of a warning about fluoride here. Fluoride warning on Austin water utility bills, direct language from the CDC and Austin City website, as well as the material safety data sheet. So I guess this is what you're proposing to put on the water bill. And the text would read, in January of 2011, the CDC lowered the maximum level of fluoride allowed in tap water from 1.2 parts per million to 0.7 parts per million. Austin currently fluoridates at 0.7 parts per million. Prolonged or repeated overexposure to fluoride compounds may cause fluorosis, and fluorosis is characterized by skeletal changes consisting of osteosclerosis and osteomalacia, and by model discoloration of the enamel teeth if exposure occurs during enamel formation. And again, that means uh, as a baby and in early childhood, uh, when people are, when you're most at risk for all kinds of uh, chemical infusions. And uh, I think the most important point, though, is that this is not just here in Austin. We've showed the other cities where they've taken it out, and they have a great network here in town, uh, Fluoride Free Austin. But people need to be doing this everywhere, confronting their city councils, wherever they are, and making this an issue. And I know people have done videos on YouTube, uh, calling out the companies, calling out the fluoridated baby water, but we need to see more. Yes, and we have, um, what's interesting about this warning, the water department here in Austin has said they will not put the warning on the bill unless the city council dictates to them and votes uh, to do that. So we've got a couple of steps to get to that point. And we need your help with this. We have a city council meeting. It's a um, public health and human services subcommittee that is going to vote three members, Morrison, Martinez, and Riley. They will potentially pass and make a recommendation that this warning be on the bill. So then it goes to the full council. Mm -hmm. Then the full council will vote. Um, so we need people at the October 18th meeting at the City Council uh, Public Health and Human Services Committee meeting at 2 p.m. Sign up would probably be around 2.30 p.m. It actually starts at 3. So yeah, that so is, that's coming up that in just a little over up two in weeks. a couple weeks, yeah. and that is a big deal. And mm -hmm. then we can get, once it gets out of that little committee, can move up to the full council and then they will vote on it and then we will see where everybody stands. Yeah, we'd like to see action on that. See that. So see is there it. anything else you'd like to tell the listening audience out there who, as you know, are worldwide and they're doing this throughout the Western world? You talked too about the graphic where there's an overall decline in, in teeth health and, and all the other factors too. Yeah, I would, uh, well, if I could go first. Go yeah, I've always said this and I think this brings it down to a really easy level to understand for everybody. You don't have to know the science at all. There's three inherent flaws with water fluoridation. Number one, it doesn't do its intended function. It was designed to prevent cavities, to benefit the teeth. Science has now shown over the past decade and a half or further that it does nothing beneficial for the teeth. And in fact, does a lot of deleterious things down the road, like the modeling of the teeth, as well as other skeletal changes. So that's, that's the first thing. It's not doing what, it, what it's supposed to do. Number two, it's not fluoride. It, you know, we talk about fluoride like it's this general term. It's hydrofluosilicic acid. It's a waste product from the fertilizer industry. The EPA does not allow it to be dumped in landfills. It cannot be aerated into the air, but somehow we can put it in our water supply. So that's the second thing. It's not fluoride. And the last thing is there's no dosage control. A little infant who is, who is fed formula, the majority of their diet is water and usually tap water. It's not going to be some nice spring water that has no fluoride in it. So a small baby will drink more water for his or her weight than I will for my weight. It's the only drug that's prescribed without a prescription. I'm glad you mentioned that because this is a line in the sand for public health yeah. everywhere. Because yeah. as you know, they propose putting lithium in mass yeah. water supplies yeah. and forced mass medication. This is yeah. not acceptable. And so if we don't say no to fluoride, we're going to see all kinds of things added. 
Mm-hmm. If, That's right. if, if I prescribe you an antibiotic, I'm going to look at your body weight, your age, and, 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 I'll, and I'll call accordingly, give them 500 milligrams. For a child, I would lower that because of the body weight and what they can consume. Fluoride, there's no dosage control. You drink what you want, you take as many showers as you want, you absorb whatever. There's no rules. And that's our argument, is that this yes. is the one medication that there's just no control over. Mm-hmm. And, let's, and make no mistake about it, that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to reiterate what Dr. Cole has said. And I've, I've talked to thousands of um, people with, in, in my business as I, over the last several years. And when I talk about fluoride, the one thing that gets everybody's eyes absolutely lit up is the concept of dose control. There is no dosage control. Where a man six and a half feet tall and a little child two to three years old gets the same amount of this chemical in one glass of water. That hits people's heart, okay? It really gets them. They don't have to understand this research, that research, and all the conflicting information. They don't have the, the technical background to really understand that, but they do understand the dose control argument. And then... And then they also have people that they know that have hypothyroidism. It's rampant in women. And it's the fluoride in the water attacks the thyroid. Your thyroid wants iodine. It competes with iodine. It competes it's stronger. The fluoride mm-hmm. competes with, with the iodine that your thyroid wants. And so you give it something else mm-hmm. that's in the environment that you're drinking, you know, tea, um, coffee, it's in foods. soups. It's in Wherever foods. things are irrigated. Yeah, deri- yes. it's a derivative into all our food. You cannot avoid it. You cannot avoid you it. Cannot. We are overloaded with fluoride. And hypothyroidism, um, ADHD, which is rampant. Yeah. Um, pineal gland issues. Pineal gland issues. And then when it's on the toothpaste, at least there's a warning on the back yes. saying it's poison. And there's you have no a choice. There's no warning on the water glass. And you have choice. a choice. There's unfluoridated toothpaste. Right. See, I like that. Yeah. But with the water, I mean, like, I have an RO system at home. I know Laura, you know, she's looked into this for years. Uh, you know, I try my best to buy, you know, all organic foods. It doesn't matter. You're still going to get it. It's there. Yeah. And by the way... You can't shower in RO water. Well, I guess you could, but you it'd could. be hard to set up a, a that whole That is very system. difficult. So, so yes, you, you know, it absorbs through your skin, you breathe it. And global warming is not the real oh. fight. These kind of chemical additives, that's what we can't take back from nature once it's synced into all the ecosystem and down the line. Right. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And, of course, Austin is one of the main fronts in this battle against fluoridation. But the battle is also wherever you are out there as a viewer. And, of course, we are viewer-supported, so we hope you will support and subscribe to the InfoWars Nightly News at PrisonPlanet.tv and InfoWarsNews.com. If you can't do that, please at least spread the word about this broadcast. Send people the videos that are out there and warn them this affects the public health of everyone all across the Western world, and they're going to push it into the third world, too. Uh, in time if we don't say no and fight back against this. These are our lives. We have to take it back from those who have other agendas. Thank you for joining us. Alex will be back on Monday. I'm Aaron Dykes sitting in. Good night.